I've learned a lot over the last 35 or 40 years about how to take care of patients that I'd like to share with you. I'd like to share you, with you the things that I've learned. Scientific research uh, on how to prevent diseases and how to cure people with a dietary change. That, that's been established by other investigators and published in the scientific journals. That's fact. Yes, people will get better if they make change. The question is, how do you get them to change? What kind of tools can you use to get people to make effective dietary changes? I've tried to do this in an office setting with success, and you can too. I've had a, a live-in program for many years where we control everything in terms of people's behaviors. Regardless of what the uh, setting is in terms of teaching people how to be healthier, I believe you have to be very clear on what they have to do, what foods they have to stop eating, and instead what foods they have to emphasize. Start eating a lot of, or all of. That kind of education took me many years to get clear on and to help share with people how to get well, how to get off their medications. You have to be very clear, very distinct about what people are supposed to do and what they're not supposed to do. I have spent, as I mentioned, almost 40 years trying to figure out how to convey this message to people, how to get them interested and to understand the dietary problems and how to fix it. And as you get older, my guess is some of you are probably approaching my age, which is 67 years old. As you get older, things get clearer, and I think it's because of the, some of the brain cells die. Those that, got, those that got us confused when we were younger and resulted in so many different thoughts. As I get older, I get more clear. Yeah, you're shaking your head. You know what I mean. I get more clear about what I want to say and how to say it. We were in Costa Rica in June of this year, and I had a little time to think, time to plan my newsletter, time to figure out how to better convey the message. And I said to Mary, I said, you know, I'm not going to write another book. And she said, well, John, you know, you really ought to write another book because we have to pay the bills. <laughs> and you realize your agent just offered you a big book deal. And it's hard for you to turn that kind of money down. And I said, yes, it is but I can't write any more word books. I've read, written 11 national best-selling word books. Those are books with words in them. And nobody seems to be reading them or understanding them for very few people. I realize you folks do. I said, so I'm not, I turned down the offer. And it was a sizable offer. I turned down the offer, I said, I will not write another book, but what I will do is I'll put together a color picture book for you. I'll show you some colored pictures and see whether or not you can understand it then or I can communicate properly with you. I put this color picture book together. I sat down with Heather's three sons who are six, eight, and ten, and I showed them the color picture book. And I showed them the universal signs for good, bad, right, wrong, red, green, the stoplight. And I went through the presentation I'm going to show you with just a little over 60 slides. And I asked them if they understood this. And they said, Grandpa, we understand. And they do understand, and hopefully you will understand too, as we go through Dr. McDougall's color picture book on food poisoning and how to cure it by eating various starches like beans, corn, potatoes, sweet potatoes, etc. Ladies and gentlemen, this is food poisoning that we're suffering from in our society, and until, until we clearly identify what's going on, we're not going to be able to fix it. Not as individuals, not as families, not as a community, not as a nation, not as a healthcare system. We're not going to be able to fix it until we really realize what's going on and what action has to be taken place. People are suffering from massive food poisoning. If we were talking about lead poisoning, People suffering from lead poisoning, you would understand what needed to be done, right? Or if people were infected with some microbe and they suffer from acute food poisoning, you'd know what the cause is and what the preventative action is. But we don't talk about the diseases we have in terms of that black and white, that kind of distinction, those kind of, of clear directives on how to deal with the problem, what the problem is, and how to solve it. 
So in my more simple way of thinking, and my desire to communicate to you clearly, I put together a color picture book on food poisoning and what to do about it. Food poisoning. This is food poisoning. Two-thirds of the population of the U.S. suffers from being overweight or obese. How do you find food poisoning? Do you need a special blood test? Do you need some type of imaging process? Or do you need to just open your eyes? We could walk out to the lobby here and watch people walking in the lobby and you would identify almost all of the people walking through the lobby of this hotel as suffering from food poisoning. And they're dying from it and it's costing a huge amount of money. And that food poisoning is associated with other diseases like diabetes and heart disease and arthritis. This is food poisoning. Food poisoning causes diabetes, both type 1 and type 2, by different mechanisms. But everybody knows <clears throat> that food poisoning, or that diabetes, type 2 diabetes, is caused by the food. And most people realize that if you stop the food poisoning, 100% of type 2 diabetics are cured. Yeah, 100% are cured, just by definition of the disease. It's due to diet, type 2 diabetes is and associated obesity, and you could cure it 100% of the time by stopping the food poisoning. 125 million people a year have heart attacks. About 600,000 die of heart disease every year. This is a $100 billion a year business in the U.S. Heart disease secondary to food poisoning. Arthritis, like uh, rheumatoid arthritis, psoriatic arthritis. I know for some of you, I'm going beyond what you already know. You know diabetes, you know obesity, you know heart disease, they're caused by the food. I don't think anybody walked in this room who didn't understand this. You may have some idea, a little different idea, as to which foods are causing the food poisoning, but we're all clear as to what the source of these illnesses are. Inflammatory arthritis is due to food poisoning. In May of 2014, I published a newsletter about 10 cases of severe inflammatory arthritis that were cured by changing people's diet. People with rheumatoid arthritis, psoriatic arthritis, other types of serious arthritis that are crippling and cost them twenty, thirty, forty, fifty thousand dollars a year in medications to relieve the symptoms. How often is inflammatory arthritis cured by dietary change? Pretty much a hundred percent of the time. I know that may be hard for some of you to believe. I published this 2014, May 2014 newsletter, and I did it with great comfort. 20, 30 years ago, I wouldn't have done that, even though I knew the same things, and I had several patients who had been cured of these serious arthritis. I would have been afraid to publish it. I would have been afraid that my, afraid that my colleagues would have criticized me and maybe threatened my license or my ability to get malpractice insurance, or in some other way, they would have struck out against what I had to say. Back 20, 30 years ago, but not today. When I published that newsletter, I was waiting for the Arthritis Foundation or the local community doctors to stand up and say, you're wrong, this isn't true. But nobody did and nobody would because it is true and the science is overwhelming and the cases are clear. Food poisoning. Breast, colon, and prostate cancer are due to food poisoning, but other cancers are too, in part. Even lung cancer is in part due to food poisoning. I know you think about cigarettes, and that is true. But if you look at uh, populations who eat differently, for, for example, the Japanese, 60% of the males in Japan smoke cigarettes. Yet their incidence of getting lung cancer is one-fourth of what it is in the United States, with fewer smokers. Why is that? Because when you damage yourself with this cigarette, if you have a strong body, because you're properly nourished, you can defend and repair more effectively. So you take people who are being poisoned by unhealthy foods and you add other noxious agents, such as cigarette smoking, to their regime, their life, and you enhance the toxic effects of something obvious that we all avoid, which is cigarette smoking. Breast, colon, prostate cancer, uterine cancer, and other types, even skin cancer. 
The New England Journal of Medicine published an article several years ago about sun damage in the effect of a low-fat diet and showed that sun damage effects like actinic keratosis and related basal and squamous cell carcinomas, you could reduce the recurrence of the actinic damage by about half to, to a sixth of the people who ate well a low-fat diet developed these uh, recurrences compared to people who ate the typical American diet. New England Journal of Medicine, skin cancer, you wouldn't think that was dietary related, but everything is related to your diet. Food poisoning, why do you think you know about the purple pill? It's because of massive food poisoning. You can walk in any drugstore in almost any place in the world and you can find GERD pills served over the counter. Why is this so popular? Why does everybody know about the purple pill? Why are so many people that I see taking these medications? It's because of food poisoning. Oh, you say, that's obvious. You don't have to go there to explain that to me. Everybody would know what you put in your mouth that goes through your intestine would have a major influence on the intestinal tract, all the way from the lips to the other end. It seems so obvious. But I assure you, through my medical education, and even as part of the medical education of students today, they are taught that these problems have nothing to do with food. They're due to being overstressed psychological problems, whatever, a lack of purple pills. This is food poisoning. Food poisoning. This is food poisoning. And, and a major problem for people, not just for adults, but also for children. If it was just for this problem alone, if it was only this that you identified as a toxic reaction to eating poisonous foods, we'd fix it in our school system. Who would tolerate little children having bowel movements every 3 to 15 days because of food poisoning? But it happens in your family and in your community, and uh, we know what that's due to. Particularly those of you who have been on a healthy diet. You know how to fix that problem real quick, don't you? Food poisoning. <clears throat> We've known about this for thousands of years, that people who eat unhealthy foods get fat and sick. The way I want you to think about food poisoning as if it is a common disease that existed throughout history. Kings and queens had it before. 400 years ago, the aristocrats in Europe suffered from food poisoning. They called it gout, the disease. They called it obesity. If they knew about diabetes back then, they would have called it diabetes. And they did have some ideas about diabetes. Food poisoning, it's due to eating rich foods which royalty has done for as long as history tells. The common person, they didn't get sick. They didn't get these diseases. What's happened is that back then, 3,500 years ago, 4,000 years ago, there were only a few rich people. There were some pharaohs, some queens, some kings, some priests, some priestess. And if you study these remains of these people, you will see that 3,500 years ago, 4,000 years ago, the royalty had the same diseases I just showed you. We've identified gallbladder disease with the same bile consistency as people eat the American diet back 3,500 years ago, 4,000 years ago, in the mummified remains in Egypt. We've developed extensive atherosclerosis. We've seen extensive atherosclerosis in mummies that have been examined through autopsy and through CAT scans. Extensive atherosclerosis in the arteries, in the heart, in the kidneys, in the legs, all over the body in individuals that ate rich food 3,500 years ago, 4,000 years ago. Obesity among the queens that long ago. Rich food has always made people sick and that is the problem in our society is we just have too many kings and queens and pharaohs and priests. Uh, back in the old days, only a few people could eat like kings and queens. Because of the Industrial Revolution, <clears throat> because of fossil fuels, everybody from Santa Rosa, California to Mumbai, India to China, everybody can eat rich foods, pretty much. And the consequence is that we spread the diseases of a royalty, not just from America, but to India and China and so on. That's why people are sick. Now, how do you fix food poisoning? I have to tell in a minute to address this with you because <clears throat> this is probably the most important thing that I've learned over the years. Is you, to solve poisoning problems, 
you can't be reasonable, sensible, moderate, or prudent. It doesn't work. You've tried. I've tried with my patients to ask them to cut down, just to eat a little meat, a little dairy, to eat a little bit better or a lot better. Until people understand what they're dealing with, I found that they can't get it solved. I would say that's one of the major understandings I've come through all the years is how abrupt, how impolite, how politically incorrect, how offensive I have to be to my patients to get them to solve the problems. And people spend a lot of time and a lot of money to get right in my face for me to tell them, you must stop food poisoning. You are an addict. You are dependent upon these foods because of information or psychological dependency or whatever. You are so dependent on these poisonous foods that you will not solve the problem unless you quit them entirely. You must quit them entirely. Isn't that harsh? To think that people must, at least from an educational point of view, that's the way it must be taught. And I've learned that from other habits that people have. I have never seen a cigarette smoker in all of my practice years. I have never seen a cigarette smoker quit by cutting down. The only way that I quit smoking, June 20th, 1972 at 7 a.m. in the morning, the only way I did it was I decided that I would never do that again. And if you've been a smoker, a user of other addictive types of substances, you know that was the day you solved the problem. When you said, I won't do that anymore. I've never met a hardcore drunk that sobered up by switching to beer and wine. It just doesn't happen. And likewise, you're not going to solve the problems, you and your family and friends. And I know I'm talking to many of you on the internet and here in the live audience. I'm talking to many of you who already made these changes. But I have to talk to you so that you can talk to others and maybe even you can get a little bit more fortified in the changes that you've wanted, you've wanted to make in your life. But you only do it if I make things clear, black and white. Shades of gray don't work. It's either green, go, or it's red, stop. I wish it was different, but it isn't that way. And until you look at it from those points of view, my guess is you're not going to solve it, unless you happen to be a moderate person, which I, of course, am not. Mary's a little moderate. I'm not. I do everything with 100% enthusiasm, double-A personality. I'm guessing you're just like I am. And if you are, you need somebody like me to stand up and tell you, this is what you do, and this is what you don't do. It's just like, say, with cigarette smoking. People don't tell you to switch to filtered cigarettes to solve your problem. They tell you exactly what to do. You must stop that behavior. And it's the same thing with alcohol and other substances. You must be told that what you do, instead of breathing dirty air, you breathe clean air, period. Nothing in between. Instead of drinking unhealthy and toxic liquids, you stop that and you switch to water. But what do they tell you about food? Until you have that same black and white distinction, until you understand what yes is, what good is, what green is, until you can separate that from bad, red, evil, whatever you want to call it, you're not going to be able to make the changes, in my opinion. Now, do you have to be 100%? Only from the point of view that you can't do otherwise. Sure, if you smoked one or two cigarettes a day for 60 years, you'd be fine. But anybody here who's been a tobacco addict knows you can't do that. If you can drink a glass of wine a day, maybe you'd be healthier. But hardcore drunks can't do that. If you are suffering from food poisoning in terms of obesity, heart disease, cancer, arthritis, constipation, indigestion, or a whole variety of problems, in fact, well over 90% of the problems that people suffer from in our society due to food poisoning, if you want to solve it, then you must understand clean from dirty. And that's why I'm talking to you in such a harsh manner. It's because I have to. I have no other choice. <clears throat> this is not food. That is not your food. Now, I have a cat at home. His name is Einstein. If he was hungry, he would take this animal, defeather it, open it up, and eat it. Because that's his food. This is not your food. This is not what human beings were designed to eat, I believe. I believe animal foods are the source, the major of two sources of food poisoning. So that makes it easy for you. 
If it's an animal, I don't eat it. Well, these animal foods, in addition to, in my opinion, not being the food for human beings because of our anatomy and physiology, yeah, we're survivors, I understand. You know, I've tested the human body for its ability to survive with two packs of cigarettes a day, a half a bottle of whiskey, and grease, and I've lived on it. Yes, the human being is a survivor, but ideally, what would be the best diet, not just from the point of view of health, but also your chances of succeeding? Remember, you can't be moderate. You can't be reasonable. You can't be uh, sensible. So you have to have clear distinctions as to what is clean, what is your food, and what is not. So I'm here to tell you what I believe to be the case is these uh, environmental poison-laden, microbe-laden, high cholesterol, high fat, no dietary fiber foods are food poisoning. So there's one category, animal foods. The second category of food poisoning is oil. Vegetable oil is uh, toxic. It's not food. If I were going to hand you a glass of olive oil, I bet few of you would drink it. You'd find it disgusting. You'd get sick to your stomach. It's not food. Now, when the oil is in the olive or in the orange or in the corn, then it has some healthful aspects to it. But when you rip the oil out of the corn or the orange or the bean, soybean or the olive, you have taken and make it an isolated, concentrated substance. It's no longer food. In that form, it is serious food poisoning. Just think about this. The fat you eat is the fat you wear. I ask people sometimes, I, I'm sitting thinking, remember, I have a level of frustration. I've been trying to make this communication to folks, to my patients, for almost 40 years. And I think about what I used to imagine, and what many of you probably think or don't think about, is what happens to that oil when you eat it? What happens when you put a couple tablespoons of oil on your salad? Or uh, fry your potatoes in oil? What happens to that oil? Does it just evaporate out of your ears? Where does it go? It goes under your skin and on your skin. It's food poison. So there you go. The food poisons are animal foods and vegetable oils. How do you cure food poisoning? You stop the behavior. But when somebody comes up to you and says, oh, you can't, and you'll do this with your friends and relatives. You've done it before. Somebody's done it to you. It happened to me almost 40 years ago. Somebody said, came up to me and said, John, you must stop eating meat. You must stop eating dairy. My response is, there's nothing to eat. That's all I know. All I know is meat and dairy. <clears throat> there's nothing to eat. So you can't just tell people they have to stop consuming their olive oil, their corn oil, their chicken, their fish, etc. You have to give them an option on what to do. We need to identify clearly what people are supposed to eat. If I take the meat and the dairy and the oil away from you, what are you going to eat? You're going to eat starch. That's what I believe is the human diet, is a starch-based diet. Starches are plant parts, parts of plants that are loaded with calories. You say, I don't need more calories. Yes, you do. You need calories. You need clean calories. You need calories to chase the two-year-old around. You need calories to walk to your place of business. You need calories. You can't do without calories. So I'm not, not going to give you calories in the form of protein and fat and meat and dairy and vegetable oil. Where are you going to get your calories from? The foods that you've learned to fear, starches, rice, corn, potatoes, breads, pastas, beans, peas, and lentils, that's what you have to put in place of the food poisons. And you add some uh, non-starch and green yellow vegetables. This is important for me to emphasize. The kind of diet I recommend is not a diet of non-starchy, green, yellow, red, nutrient-dense vegetables. People have tried that. I have all kinds of folks that are on the periphery of following our diet, all kinds of folks who come and now understand our dietary principles, who say, I'm a vegetarian. I eat a nutrient-dense diet. I eat a diet of kale and broccoli and cauliflower. And I say, how are you doing? And they say, I'm starving to death. 
Yes, you are. You will starve to death. The diet that I teach, the diet I know will cure food poisoning, is not based on broccoli, cauliflower, and kale and lettuce. These non-starchy green and yellow vegetables are nice additions to your starch-based diet of rice, corn, potatoes, which do provide calories. And, and you can also add fruits. Not a lot of fruit. A little fruit's okay. Maybe one, two, three, four fruits a day would be fine. Fruitarians? How many fruitarians do you know? Steve Jobs was a fruitarian for a short period of time. But there are a few fruitarians here and there, but why hasn't it been a successful diet to live on fruit? You could. There's enough calories in fruit. But they're simple calories. They're simple sugars. They don't lead to sustained satisfaction of the appetite. And plus, except for our modern society, which provides fruit 12 months of the year at Whole Foods and Safeway, fruits disappear in the fall and winter. So you could not live on a fruit-based diet. They're nice additions to your starch-based diet. Starches last all year long, either underground, as underground storage organs in the form of potatoes and sweet potatoes, or above-ground storage organs for the plants in the form of grains, rice, barley, wheat, corn. These are plant parts starches where they store energy, the plants do, for their own use, and that we can tap in to get our calories. Until you understand the necessity of a starch-based diet, you'll be fumbling. You will not be able to solve food poisoning. You'll be starving on kale and lettuce or still into the animal foods and oils to get your calories. But once you understand the starch piece, it all makes sense. The kind of recommendations that I make are based on thousands of years of human observation and 10, 20, 30,000 scientific studies that prove that people do better on the kind of diet I recommend versus the rich Western diet. I, I was recently in India and I tried to show this slide. Didn't work well. I should have talked about the Bhagavad Gita or some other type of Hindu philosophy or some other type of religious philosophy because it's all talked about in the Quran and various other religious teachings about what people are supposed to eat and why the rich people get sick. This is old knowledge. My best reference for people in this country would be the Bible. In the Bible they talk about food poisoning and how it was cured or how it was prevented. The first chapter of the Bible, Daniel talks to the gatekeeper. He says, let's do an experiment. Let's feed my men vegetables and water, pulses and water, and see what happens compared to your men who are eating from the king's table. 2,500 years ago, they did the first controlled trial on food in terms of prevention of disease. Now what was said at the end of this discussion in the first chapter of Daniel is those who lived on the healthy food were much trimmer, younger looking than the men who ate from the king's table. Old knowledge. Now the next thing that people think about when I say you have to give up the meat and the dairy is they say, okay, if I'm going to live on one of those vegetable-based diets, I'm going to be weak. I'm not going to be the kind of person that I need to be to succeed in life, physically, mentally, or emotionally. Well, that's not true. This is an old story about strong people. I think the best example, the one that I most like to tell, is the story about the gladiators. From 1800 years ago, there was a recent excavation of a burial site in Ephesus, which is now modern-day Turkey. And what they did is they looked at this grave plot and what they found was 60 skeletons. And they analyzed these skeletons. First, they noticed they were all male. Second, they noticed the tools of occupation of these males, which were shields and tridents and swords. And they had trident holes in their skulls. So they came to the conclusion that these were gladiators. And then they analyzed the bones of the gladiators. And what they found in their chemical analysis of the bones was something that fits with the historical account of gladiators. Gladiators are known as the barley men. They lived on barley and beans. They were vegan. Why did they do that? Because it was an occupational hazard to suffer from food poisoning. You only got to go in the arena once if you weren't strong and enduring. And they do back then, as people knew three, four thousand years ago, as modern athletes do today. 
long distance runners, bicyclists, as they know today, if you're going to win the event, you must eat carbohydrates, starches. And these people, the gladiators, took it to the extreme because it was extreme to lose in the Colosseum. So now that, tell that to your friends and relatives when they say, oh no, I'm not going to go on this kind of diet because I will be weak, I won't be strong. That's not true. It's exactly just the opposite. The benefits happen quickly. The nice thing about curing food poisoning, just like when you quit cigarettes, within a day or two you stop coughing. When you quit the booze, usually the alcohol poison gets out of your system in a couple of days. The benefits are immediate. And what we have seen, I've taken care of almost 10,000 people, almost 6,000 in a live-in situation. What I see, and you've experienced it also, if you haven't, you should, is immediately you see benefits. The bowels change just like that. Overnight, like one of the uh, one of the added expenses they have at the Flamingo Hotel is toilet paper. I would guess immediately the constipation goes away. Immediately the GERD goes away. Immediately the greasy skin becomes less oily, and the complexion starts to clear. Immediately the fatigue is improved. That's what we see, and we have data. We've published data on 500 people. We have data about to be published on 1,615 people who have made this change. Nobody was excluded from the analysis. And what we find is that within seven days, the average drop in cholesterol, no medication changes, the average drop in cholesterol is 23 milligrams per deciliter. The average drop in blood pressure, and we stop almost everybody's blood pressure pills, is 8 over 4 millimeters of mercury. The average weight loss is about three pounds, eating as much as you want of the kinds of foods that we're going to serve you this weekend. No starvation, no lack of enjoyment, immediate results, and long term, if you have food poisoning and you stop the repetitive injury from the knife and fork, you will solve most of your food problems, food poisoning problems, within four months. You can just count on it. You can do anything for four months. In four months, you'll have lost significant amounts of weight, maybe 40 pounds if you need to. In four months, the inflammatory conditions like arthritis will have gone. You may be left with residual. You may be left with some deformities, some arthritic changes that are permanent, just like if you're a smoker. You may be left with some scars in your lungs, but the acute illness stops. And it stops because you stop the repetitive injury from food poisoning. Let me give you an example of how easy this is to cure people. It is no more, don't make a bigger deal out of it than this. Say you had a psychiatric problem and you threw acid on your hand every day and you burnt the skin on your hand. Just every day you did that. You developed sores, and blisters, uh, healing would be going on. You would have a significant damage to your skin, a chronic illness. Say one day you got wisdom and you decided you're not going to throw acid on your skin anymore. What would happen? Whether you go to church or not, whether you carry around a good luck charm or not, whether you're a good person or not, whether you exercise or not, what would happen? Once you stop the repeated injury, the hand would heal. Always does. Just like the cough from cigarette smoking, just like the liver dysfunction from alcoholism, etc. When you stop the food poisoning, the body innately, naturally heals itself. It's one of those properties that we have as living organisms, the ability to heal. Thank goodness, otherwise doctors would look terrible. Fortunately, we can intervene a little bit and do some acute problem solutions like as saw up lacerations and, and stabilize broken bones, but it's the body that does the healing. I remember as a resident taking care of cancer patients who we destroyed their immune system either by the cancer or the chemotherapy and they would get infected. We could give them tens of thousands of dollars worth of antibiotics. They never got well because they had lost that natural innate ability to heal themselves. That's where healing comes from is inside. What we have to do is we have to identify the food poisons and stop those poisons. I will show you the food poisons so you're not confused. This is a food poison. Food poison. Yes, even fish is food poison. And thank goodness fish are loaded with methyl mercury and may end up saving the few fish that are left. 
food poisoning. You may recognize these as all similar problems. These are muscles of animals. One animal muscle, the beef, moves the limb. The other animal muscle flaps the wing. And another animal muscle wiggles the tail. Why would they be different when you eat them? The same types of burdens on the body. The same lack of nutrients in all of these various muscles. They're all muscles of animals. You have probably recognized this for your whole life as food poison. Regardless of what animal it comes from, milk is not intended for the human being. At least that milk is not intended for human beings after weaning. Certainly not as adults. And certainly it would be bizarre for you to serve whale milk or seal milk or hippopotamus milk at your table, wouldn't it? Food poison. Food poison? Butter and margarine, this is food poison. So it's making you sick. Yeah, you can get by with a little bit. Yes, you can. But you can't. You can't do it. And one last thing I want to address is many of you are trying to eat a healthier diet. You're trying to solve your problems. And you've been taken down the wrong path to fake foods, to uh, fake burgers made of isolated soy proteins, or fake cheeses, 90% oil. Those are not the things you're supposed to substitute for the real animals. Would it be environmentally more conscientious to eat these fake meats and dairy products? Probably. Would it be kinder to animals? Most definitely. But will it solve your food poisoning problems? No. You'll just end up being a fat vegan. <laughs> you cannot substitute these fake animal foods for the real animal foods to solve the problem. And oil, as I discussed, is an isolated, concentrated substance. You can call it a nutrient. It is not food. At best, it's medicine. At worst, it's a serious food poison. Now, why do we continue believing otherwise? Now, why does everybody believe that you need to have meat and dairy? Why, when you leave here, if you aren't converted already, and you get converted this week, and oh, why? Amen. Why, we convert you. Why, when you go out and you say to somebody, I'm vegetarian, vegan, or I don't eat animal foods, or I don't eat meat or dairy, why will the first thing they come back and say to you is, that's unhealthy? Because everybody knows to get protein, you must eat meat and eggs, right? And to get calcium, you must eat yeah, dairy. But anybody who's well read in the science, and everyone should know this, there is no such thing as protein deficiency. It's never occurred in any natural circumstance outside of starvation, where everything is deficient when you starve. There's no such thing as protein deficiency or amino acid deficiency. It's never been described on any natural diet. Likewise, there's no such thing as calcium deficiency. No one has ever developed a disease due to dietary calcium deficiency. It's non-existent. But everybody knows. Everybody knows. And the third thing is, when I say omega-3 fats, your friends will say, fish. No fish ever made an omega-3 fat, ever. The omega-3 fats are all made by plants. Only plants can desaturate at the carbon-3 position. So we have all this false information. Why do we have the false information? Excuse me, ladies and gentlemen, it's just business. Nobody's trying to hurt you. It's just a matter of making money. That's what the people in these industries do. You may take it personal. Get over it. The dairy farmer is suffering from a heart attack. The beef farmer's wife is going, undergoing a mastectomy for breast cancer. And the children of the beef and dairy and eggs and the fishing industry people, their children are fat and sick, full of acne and constipated. Like everybody else, if it was a conspiracy, they would keep their kin healthy and let all of us suffer. It's just business. They're just trying to pay the bills, pay the mortgage, put shoes on the grandkids. That's it. The entire food industry is based on false information that anybody can verify it to be false. You will find nothing contradictory to what I said in any research that I'm aware of.
So what do we eat? We eat starches. That's because everybody ate starches worldwide, all populations throughout all human history, which were civilized in any substantial number of people. All civilizations in the past lived on starch, like the Aztecs and Mayans were known as the people of the corn. That was their diet, is corn, vegetables, a few human hearts here and there. The Asians have lived primarily on rice. The breadbasket of the world, when you turn on the news tonight, and you watch the evening news, they'll be talking about countries in the breadbasket of the world. Syria, Iraq, Iran, Egypt. That's the breadbasket of the world. Bread is supposed to be evil these days. That was the staff of life, bread. Still is. So you live on starch like... Nine and a half of the 10 billion people who've walked this earth have gotten the bulk of their calories from starch. Now, were they vegans? No. But people ate whatever they could, anything they could find, insects, decayed matter, meat, berries, anything they'd find they would eat. The body is very tolerant. It's very resistant to toxic things that we do to it. So, if you can eat a little bit of meat, a little bit of dairy, that would be fine. But you can't. I know you can't, because I've tried to get you to do it. It's much easier if we take this black and white approach and decide not to, not to do the food poisoning, what makes you unhealthy. So here are the foods you can eat. You can eat as much as you want, and you will solve food poisoning. This is cleaning food. Yes, you can argue some of it's processed, some of it has additives, and I will, I will understand that. But when I tell you not to eat the meat, the dairy, and the oil, you go, what's there left to eat? Let's see what there's left to eat. How about cold cereals or hot cereals? Pancakes. I think we're having griddle cakes tomorrow morning for breakfast. Hash brown potatoes. Yeah. These things look good, don't they? How about this? Compared to yellow and brown food that has no flavor or maybe even disgusting flavor. I don't know where you're at this point or not in your evolution in terms of dietary change. But every time I go to the grocery store, whether it be Whole Foods or Oliver's or Safeway, whenever I go to the grocery store, one of the most difficult times I have is walking down the meat aisle. It's disgusting, the sights and smells. You may not be there yet, but this is naturally peeling food. My cat Einstein would be interested. Gave him a baked potato, he just batted around like a ball of yarn. Not interested. It's not his food. But likewise, the reason you have these adverse reactions to the meat and the dairy is because it's not your food. Nothing personal. It's just not your food. I couldn't get my kidney patients to eat saltless butter and saltless cheese when I was a resident. They wouldn't eat it. They'd say, Doc, that's a glob of fat. I won't eat it. It's only because of the salt that you'll eat the cheese. You can't eat the meat unless you cook it, cover it up with a1 steak sauce, ketchup, sweet and sour sauce, something to disguise the flavor. Because it's not your food. This is your food. The reason you like these pictures is this is your food. You have a natural attraction to this because this is your food. That's how you solve food poison. Various kinds of soups, vegetable soups. In fact, all soups are vegetable soups, pretty much. Uh, chicken soup is really a vegetable soup. Yeah, I think so. Potatoes, various, various forms, but not fried. Mashed potatoes. We had the kids, the grandkids, over a couple nights ago, babysitting duties. And what Mary fixed was mashed potatoes and broccoli for the kids. Their favorite meal. They come, our three grandkids, Chloe, of course, is my, is my only granddaughter, but our three grand boys that live here, they come to the program one day, and that's the last day of the 10-day program. Why? Because we serve mashed potatoes, and I believe that's what we're having tonight. I could live on mashed potatoes. When I was growing up, I think the only reason I'm alive today is because my mother knew how to make great mashed potatoes. My brother Bill is here, and I know he remembers. We'd sit down, and Mom would make this great big bowl of uh, mashed potatoes, and we'd fill it up, and we'd have peas and corn with it, and put a ground, brown gravy over it. Of course, back then, the brown gravy was not what we recommend today. But still, we have a great brown gravy tonight that you're going to enjoy. Over the you will love it. You will, it. Once you understand that it's nutritionally adequate, it has all the protein, calcium, vitamins, and minerals you need, then you can eat it with confidence. But as long as you're living under misinformation, it's not going to happen for you. 
sweet potatoes. You can live on white potatoes and sweet potatoes alone in water. Say for B12, we'll talk about for a minute. You can, people have, in South America, they lived on potatoes alone in the Andes. That's all they had, dating back to 14,000 years. In Western Europe, since the 1700s, it made the difference as to the economy and the health and the populations of various countries in Western Europe, the potato did. Between 1800 and 1900 in Poland and in Russia, that's all they had was potatoes. Because of economic circumstances in post-World War II in Germany, that's all they had was potatoes. You can live on potatoes and water alone, or sweet potatoes and water alone. You can't live on grains or legumes alone. They're missing vitamin A and C. But if you decide to eat a grain-based diet, then the way you solve that deficiency is you add uh, maybe a slice of orange for A and C, or a floweret of broccoli, and there you go. You got it all. Breads, the staff of life. If there's one food that I would like to people to stop maligning, it would be bread. How about that? Comfort food, particularly any of you who are from the Mediterranean area. This is your food. This is what grandma served you. Why do you like this? It's your food. Rice. Two million Asians, up until recently, two billion Asians up until recently lived on rice. <clears throat> Sometimes you can't find brown rice. Two billion Asians have lived on white rice successfully. It's not a deal breaker. We'll only serve you brown rice here. But if you come to one of our trips, like to Costa Rica or Hawaii, we'll have white rice and brown rice. It's a vacation. Brown rice is better, but white rice works for people. White rice. Not ideal. Don't misunderstand me. I just want to win the war. I don't have to win every little battle. So when you're out, you have a choice of a Japanese restaurant, Chinese restaurant, white rice versus the meat and the oil. This is what you want to do, is the refined grains. How to cure food poisoning. This went over well in Middle Eastern countries because of the grain-braced food. Veggie burgers, I don't know whether they're going to have those this weekend or not, but they're one of the favorite our 10-day program. Various kinds of sandwiches, big hit. This is not strange food. This is what you like. You can have some fruits, one to four a day. That's enough. And you can have some green and yellow vegetables. But if you go on a green and yellow vegetable diet, you will starve to death. It won't work for you. If you're trying to be a vegan or a vegetarian and you're into these nutrient-dense foods, it won't work. You must have a source of calories, which is starch. Be careful about tofu and other natural products like miso, tempeh. They're not unhealthy. In fact, they're, they're kind of healthy, but they're rich. So you want to keep those as a small part of your diet. Remember I said none of these fake foods like fake burgers and fake cheeses. These would be natural soy products that have been consumed for 5,000 years in Asia as a condiment, a couple ounces a day, not the center of the diet. Be careful about nuts and seeds. I know so many fat vegans who can't understand why no one will listen to them about their concerns of animal rights and the environment when they're 200 pounds overweight. It's not because of good intentions that are lacking in good intentions. It's because they're eating this very rich food. Nuts and seeds are rich food. Nature put them in hard shells for a reason. Coconut is the new most popular food, isn't it? Well, think about opening a coconut with your bare hands and see how much of that rich food you could eat. Unless you need to gain weight or need some extra calories, like as a child possibly, or an athlete, these should be a minimal part of your diet. 90% fat. Don't kid yourself. They're not unhealthy. Nuts, seeds, and avocados are not unhealthy. They're just rich. Dried fruits, if you need some extra calories, you're an athlete, you're getting too thin, Add some dried fruits or some nuts and seeds and avocados. But if you're having trouble losing the weight and you wonder why, very calorie dense foods. You do not improve the quality of a food by beating it a thousand times with a steel blade. Don't kid yourself, you don't need more nutrients by making vegetable juice and fruit juice. You don't need it. Nobody you know suffers from vitamin or other kinds of deficiencies. 
So turning a perfectly good fruit or vegetable into a pulverized juice, well, you can tolerate that. Remember, I lived on two packs of cigarettes, a half a bottle of whiskey and grease. The body is a survivor, so if you want to include a little juice, fine, but it's not going to be ideal in terms of weight loss, lowering triglycerides, etc. Little was okay. Salt and sugar. Why do I use salt, sugar, and spice? Because you like them. People say, in fact, I've heard it recently, that I make compromises in what I recommend. I do. I have drawn certain lines around my recommendations. And one of the lines is you don't eat animal foods and you don't eat vegetable oils. But Dr. McDougall, you allow salt and sugar. Why do you do that? Because I want you to eat the food. And you won't if I don't add some salt, and sugar, and spice. I mean, some of you will, but most of you won't. That's what you love, the salt, sugar, and spice, the tip of the tongue tastes with pleasure, salt and sugar. It wasn't a mistake to have that design on your tongue. I can reward you tremendously by giving you a little salt and sugar. Not ideal, but I can get you to eat the potatoes and the rice if I put a little salt, sugar, and spice over it, and that's why I use it. Plus, as I say, I have to draw the line someplace, and you can properly criticize me if you want for adding a little salt and sugar to the food because I want you to eat the food. But the health impact of salt and sugar compared to animal foods and oils is minimal, I can argue scientifically based on my experience. Plus, the environmental costs of producing salt and sugar are virtually none. Whereas half the greenhouse gases, as you've heard, are produced from livestock production and no animal was ever hurt by making salt or sugar. You have seen the factory farm videos. You know what I'm talking about. So that's why I draw the line where I do. I allow some salt, sugar, and spice. May not be perfect. I'm not into perfection. I just want to cure your problems and change the world. That's it. <laughs> supplements, you don't want to take these supplements. Supplements are dangerous. They're isolated, concentrated nutrients. The U.S. Preventative Services Task Force, the Cochrane Collaboration, tells you they're useless and harmful. Not only are you wasting your money when you take these even one-a-day mineral supplements, you increase your risk of heart disease, cancer, and death. The Cochrane Collaboration says for people who take multivitamins, you know the little one-a-day things? For every million vitamin users, multivitamin users, there's an extra 9,000 deaths. Don't take, yes, take the vitamins and minerals in the natural packages, but not as isolated concentrated nutrients. B12, I do add a little B12 to the diet. Why? Because mostly I want to add, avoid controversy, but Mary and I do ourselves personally take B12. There's some relevance to taking B12. Why would the diet I recommend be so perfect in terms of fiber and calcium and protein, and et cetera, have any deficiency at all? Well, that's a long explanation that I could go into, but let me tell you briefly, it's because B12 is made by bacteria, and maybe these days we live too hygienically, as a consequence, there may have been six or eight cases in the entire world literature of actual disease caused by B12 deficiency. Yes, there are metabolic changes that are reported, but actual disease, extremely rare. But I don't want to hurt anybody. You know, I don't want anybody to walk away and say, well, you know, I cured my heart disease, I lost 80 pounds, my type 2 diabetes went away, but I got B12 deficiency. No need to that. So I add a non-animal source of B12 to the diet I recommend. And the fourth of a vitamin supplement you can buy in any natural food store. To avoid controversy, but it is a serious recommendation. Exercise and sunshine, be careful. If it's a yellow light, be careful because I was just at the, before getting myself pretty for you. I went to the hairdresser a couple days ago and had my haircut. Just in the time that I had my last haircut, which was probably two to three months before, she had told me she has a riding group, 20 bicyclers. Just in the time since my last haircut, one fell off her bike, got a collie's fracture, and broke her collarbone. The other person, at age 25, fell off the bike, and she's still in rehab for the concussion and the crashed helmet that she had. Exercise is dangerous. How many people do you know that have been run over, fallen potholes, damaged their hips and joints from exercise? Not that there aren't some benefits, but it's taught as if it's a panacea. Like the U.S. Preventative Services Task Force, they give equal weight to diet and exercise. Not so. You can't cure food poisoning with more exercise. Don't even try. You may cover up some of the outward signs, but 
Jim Fix died at 58. Remember him? Food poisoning. The graveyards are littered with marathon runners dying from heart disease from food poisoning because they thought they could compensate for food poisoning by exercise. Yeah, get a little exercise. Be careful. Be careful. And sunshine? Yes, a little sunshine. If you're a lily white person like myself living in California, I must be extra careful. If you're a dark person living in New York, you must be extra careful to get some extra sunshine. You need sunshine for good health. Vitamin D is not a vitamin. Not really. It's a hormone that's produced by the body as a consequence of sunshine production. Always has been the sunshine vitamin until it became business. One last thought, and that is if you don't care, I mean, I know you care, so please excuse me on the internet and in the audience for me even suggesting you don't care. You wouldn't be here if you didn't care. <clears throat> but I'm at an age and stage in my life, almost 40 years of practice, where I've cured enough, helped people cure enough diabetes and heart disease and constipation. It's not about you dying of a heart attack or you dying of breast cancer or uh, diabetes. It's not about that anymore for me. It is a little bit, but not a lot. More for me are the consequences to future generations. I met one of my grandchildren. I have six grandkids and one on the way. Once you're a grandfather or grandmother, everything changes as far as your perspective. You who are in that position know. And we do think about the future. Remember, half the greenhouse gases are produced by livestock production. And that's something we could change right now. If we could get the whole audience watching this, we got solid recommendations from uh, Prime Minister Modi from India, or Putin from Russia, or Obama from America, or our Surgeon Generals stood up and said, this is food poisoning, we need to solve it tomorrow, it's poisoning people, it's poisoning the planet, stop it, and we could do it overnight. But you can't do that with transportation or energy needs. It would take decades to solve it. We have the opportunity to make significant changes by just having this one concept that it's not a mystery why people are sick. It's not genetics. It's not lifestyle. It's food poisoning. That's what people are dying of, is food poisoning. You take that single-minded attitude and you can fix it. You can say no. I've done it with multiple habits in my previous life. I still have a few I'm working on it. But I have done it, and you can do the same thing by just saying no. And that's what the McDougall program is about. <clears throat> that's what Mary and I had the opportunity to share with you for almost 40 years.